Welcome to the Embodiment Matters podcast with me, Erin Giesemann Rabke, and my husband, Carl Rabke. Embodiment Matters is an ongoing, rich conversation about what it really means to be embodied and why and how embodiment matters so much in our daily lives and in our modern world. You can find out more about our wonderful guests about our work, you can sign up for our newsletter, and find out how to become a supporting member of our podcast online at embodimentmatters.com. Hi friends, it's Erin here, and wow, do we have a rich episode for you today. Carl and I recorded this great conversation with Michael Mead on June 25th of 2020, and um, what a profoundly deep freewheeling, wide-ranging conversation. We begin exploring with Michael a topic that he's been teaching on for years and has been so powerful in our own lives and teaching as well, which is about the topic of innate genius, Um, about the origins of how he started teaching about this when he was working with severely at-risk youth, and about how Honoring the perspective of the unique genius is a great equalizer across all races, classes, and other human categories. We also explore this ancient notion Michael often teaches about that the genius hides behind the wound and how during these intensive times in the world with reckoning with racist history in the U.S. and elsewhere, coronavirus and more, for many people, core wounds are activated, which Michael also says means genius is nearby. We explore the perspective of these times being ones of initiation that can really help awaken us to ourselves, to our gifts and our wounds. Michael speaks a lot about the function of community in initiation, Uh, what he's learned in over 35 years of studying and creating rites of passage. Um, We speak about how we're in a big time of not knowing, and at the same time, the soul knows exactly what this not knowing time is in terms of initiation. He says we're being called to new levels of humanity, and also explore the importance of ritual and even the possibility of protests as being rituals. We explore this beautiful African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, and its powerful second half, which states, if the young people aren't welcomed into the village, they will burn it down just to feel the warmth and the ways we're seeing this happen now around the U.S. and beyond. Oh, we speak about politics and Michael's emphasis on the fact that if we want the world to change, it has to start in the human soul. We also speak about elders, deceased writers, people we revere, and the way their souls are still reverberating in our world today. Uh, We talk about transformation, the importance of shedding that which is not working before we return or build the new. Um, We also explore Ah, the meaning of the word apocalypsis, which is not the end of times, but about collapse and renewal, as we see again and again in the natural world. What a beautiful, wild and wise ride we have on this conversation. We hope you enjoy it as much as we did. We also wanted to let you know Michael has a new live online series coming up um, just three Friday evenings, U.S. time, um, which we highly recommend. We've been attending every one of these he's offered so far in recent months, and they're just great. He's also offering a discount on uh, this class to Embodiment Matters podcast listeners. Um, And you use the discount code capital E-M-B-O-D 20, EMBOD 20 (laughs) at checkout. It's not very expensive in the first place, so it's wonderful they offer the discount. And you can learn more about Michael Mead, his many gorgeous books, his podcast, his online teaching, and more at his website, which is mosaicvoices.org. Mosaicvoices.org. We're so grateful for Michael and his work and so thrilled to share this conversation with you. 
Thanks so much for being a listener. Special thanks to our podcast supporters who are donating a few dollars each month. Um, if you're inspired to be one of those, we sure love to have you. You can find out more about that at embodimentmatters.com. Enjoy the episode. So welcome, Michael Mead. We are so happy to be here with you today. And it's good to be back with you. <laughs> so we, we always like to start off with the simple questions, you know. Um, and <laughs> I was thinking of the Suzuki Roshi quote where he says, the most important thing is to remember the most important thing. And I wonder, what do you think is the most important thing right now in this wild time we're in on planet Earth? Hmm. Well, first thing comes to my mind is health. Mm. Because if we don't have our health, we can't deal with other things. But the way I'm thinking about health, besides physical health because of the pandem pandemic and COVID-19, but I'm really thinking about the health of humanity, mm -hmm. that I think um, we're being challenged to find the depth of humanity again. Um, one way I've been looking at it is we're in this um, cascade of crises. So there was a point a few months back where um, some of the major conversations were about climate crises, which is still going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it shifted to the coronavirus crises, which was related, I thought, and made it about you start out with the health of the planet and then you're at the health of the person. And then came the killing of George Floyd and it became the civil rights crisis. And it became, I think, the deep humanitarian crisis of injustice and, and everything that goes along with that. Uh, so I think they're all health related. Mm -hmm. If you look at COVID affecting in a disparate way, different parts of the population, um, and the other thing that strikes me there is all three have death in it. Mm. The, the climate crisis includes the death of a species, the loss of species on a daily basis. And then, of course, COVID has been uh, like a brush with death for the whole world mm -hmm. and, and literal death for many people, many of them unnecessary. And then we actually watched George Floyd uh, go from life to death uh, as his breath was taken away. And, and, and so there's been this descent by way of death. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's health and death um, and, and the struggle for a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody can escape it anymore. I think we're in it. Mm -hmm. Michael, I want to read um, a little passage from the description of your upcoming uh, online class on initiation. You say that sweeping changes can be disconcerting, yet in critical moments, the inner genius and wisdom of the soul become both more important and more available. When enough people awaken to the inherent purpose and meaning of their lives, a collective initiation can occur that shifts the level of meaning as well as alters the course of history. So I'm wondering if you can talk just a little bit, maybe for those who aren't familiar with the term genius, about what that is, and, and what about these kind of sweeping changes both require and evoke genius? Okay, good question. So genius is the Latin word that's known well in the Western world for the unique spirit of a person. So um, uh, when... Mm, many years ago when Mosaic, we were doing all this work with severely at-risk youth, gang kids, street kids, homeless kids, and, and, they, and they were literally dying in front of us the way, the way people are now experiencing the death that's coming through COVID, where you turn around and someone has died, you get these messages. Only these were young people dying in the streets and all. And, and it, it just broke my heart. And it just pushed me to say, uh, I had this realization I would be working in Chicago with these gang kids and then I'd be gone for two months and I'd come back and I'd come back and someone say, remember so-and-so? Well, she's dead. 
he's dead. And I just could not bear it. They were 15, they were 16. And I realized though, um, sometimes I might have one chance to talk to that young person before they wind up in jail or wind up dead. What can I say to them that could be meaningful to them? Mm -hmm. That's what I, that was my question. And, and so I contemplated that and worked on that. And I realized the thing I could say is, um, well, would be a question. Do you know that you have genius, that you were born with genius? Um, and it turned out to be a profound thing. I mean, hardened kids from the Vario, from the hood would say, what do you mean? And I said, well, genius means the spirit that brought you into life, that came in with you, the unique gifts that you have to give and the essence of your unique life. And they would go, oh, okay, yeah, I get that. And how does it work? It's, I'm telling you. What, so, so genius, um, people think of it as high IQ mm -hmm. or unusual talent. But the word means the spirit that's already there. Mm -hmm. So genius is the spirit that was there when we were born. And you can look at it two ways, that we're bringing our genius to the world when we're born, or the genius is bringing us to the world in order to give what we have to the world. So that's the underlying idea. People are not empty. Every girl, every boy, no matter the background, no matter the status of the family, no matter the ethnic orientation, has genius. So then you say, okay, we're in this radical period in history where nature is rattling and culture is unraveling right before us. And there's no way to fix it, no uh, what do you call that? No committee in Congress is going to solve all this stuff. They don't even know how to talk about it. Um, and no hero is going to come in, uh, like Western people often think about, and the mistakes people make by trying to elect someone who claims they can fix it. It's only going to get fixed when enough people awaken to what their own genius is, what their gifts are, and when enough people begin to follow those genius paths, some people are going to turn out to be physical healers that can make a vaccine or to figure out how to distribute a vaccine. Others are going to know how to go right into the uh, emergency ward and do the healing, but others are going to know how to heal nature, how to heal rivers, how to reconnect to the animals. It, the genius is unique and, and diverse. So I think the only way we get through this is awakening the genius of many, many people and encouraging each other and helping each other give our gifts that are going to be ways of healing and ways of remaking community. That's my sense. Mm -hmm. mm, I just love that. I, you're, we, yeah. I, I just want to say, for, I don't even remember when your first audio series on the genius came out. I treasure the learning from that so deeply in my life and working with people. It's just, thank yeah. you for how you keep holding that up. And, um, well, yeah. You know, as a parent, you know it. Yeah. yeah if, you know, like I had four children and each one was so uniquely different in a way that is palpable. Mm -hmm. And then you realize they each carrying gifts. And so cultures are going to have to understand how to bring those gifts out. And then, and teachers, all the teachers know it. You yeah. see the kids come into the classroom, you can see the genius in each of them. This is a time of rediscovering imagination, and, and real education. In other words, to me, education is not a school system. That's a part of education. We have to educate the people. We have to educate the public. Look what people are doing, the, the lack of education, the misunderstanding, the people walking around saying, I won't wear a mask because it imposes on my liberty. That is so profoundly unknowledgeable that some new form of education is required. And you want to say to whoever they are, listen, you have a genius too. And this is not about materialism or opening business. The mm -hmm. business will come along if people act out of genius. But you, even you, your freedom is, is, is a freedom to express, not a freedom from. It's so limited. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yes. But <laughs> and genius makes us all equal. Yeah. Yes. yeah. The, the most, the, the, the least... Um, racist thing anybody could imagine is the uniqueness of the spirit of everybody. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, no one can be diminished. So yeah. it has function on all those levels. That's so beautiful. Yeah. I know one of the things that you've said, and maybe this is an ancient Greek 
idea or Rumi or I don't even remember where this comes from, but about the genius hiding behind the wound and both personally and collectively right now. And I know you're talking about tapping the genius, like yeah. how, how can we do that with ourselves and with each other? To bring- well, that's a really old idea. And I, no one knows who said it first, but it became <laughs> better known because of Carl Jung. Mm-hmm. Carl Jung said genius hides behind the wound. Mm-hmm. And so, so the, the, my way of understanding that, genius is one of the deepest things in the soul. It's the spirit hidden in the soul. Um, another word for it is the light found inside the dark. And the other thing deepest in the soul is the core wounds of a person. Mm. So the two deep things are the core gifts of a person and the core wounds of a person. And one of the things that's happening now, near as I can tell, personally, hearing from friends and hearing from friends who are therapists, is everybody's core wounds are activated. Mm -hmm. That's what happens in the middle of a rite of passage. And so the presence, the threat of death, the intensification of mortality, the knowledge that each breath of life could also bring COVID into the lungs has kind of stimulated this kind of uh, life and death uh, interior. Um, and so at the bottom, everybody has core wounds. And for some people that manifests as depression, for others as mania, for some, you know, people just have to get to know themselves. And so, um, so now is a time when, however I wrote that out, when we're actually closer to the genius because it's deep and we're being pushed deep by the things happening in the world, but we're also co- closer to the core wounds. And so there's two ways to get to the genius. You can go right there and say, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know my genius. But if a person doesn't know, just go to the wounds and you're right next to it. <laughs> <laughs> go to the wounds and, and look around. <laughs> yeah. The, and so, so to me, this is the bottom line of initiatory pr- uh, process or rite of passage. In the middle of the experience, um, you know, initi- initiation in a sense means to awaken to oneself. Mm-hmm. And in the midst of the awakening, there are two elements. Mm-hmm. Awakening to the gifts, the capacities and the orientation or the calling of my life and the awakening to the core wounds that are there practically from the beginning. And so as I understand initiation, it was an awakening healing process. And then my understanding is once you get this idea, then all meaningful steps in life are partly an awakening and partly a healing Mm. that throughout our lives, the path of our lives is they have to go together. I mean, I don't know what Jung was thinking, but the gifts and the wounds go together. And, And the way I see that you find someone whose gifts have become publicly evident and that could be uh, a famous actress or a musician you know the kind of people that get celebrated and they get lifted up as if their gifts are exposed to everybody and what happens next is their wounds are exposed Mm -hmm. Uh, i watched this uh, biography of Jimi hendrix a documentary and what a genius i mean an utter genius Mm -hmm. he was part native american by the way and some of his rhythm was going back to Native American songs, all this cool stuff. But once he got elevated, the gifts, which were, uh, the gifts were there, and then the wound came rushing up, which in his case had to do with never being accepted by his father and feeling this deep rejection, which got intensified by racism and so on. And the next thing, the wound is beginning to swallow the gifts and so on. Mm-hmm. And so it would be the function of the community to help that person heal the wounds and learn how to handle the gifts. Mm -hmm. And so it then turns out that genius and the presence of the wound is the essence of making community. Mm -hmm. That that community (laughs) is there to receive the gifts and help heal the wounds. Mm -hmm. And then the, for the individual, the community is necessary because you get the confirmation of who you are in essence and the blessing and the help of getting healing from the people around you. And so we're already pushed into the core wounds. That's happened without our choice. Um, So I think it moves the genius closer to uh, consciousness. And I think it pushes the wounds up 
closer to consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Michael, I have a couple questions around this. So one, with initiation traditionally being held by community and by elders, and right now, you know, looking up to the leadership is doing quite the opposite. So how, and, and even the relationship with community is so different with social distancing and everything happening on Zoom. So how does that play in? And then how does it end <laughs> in terms of uh, a return? Because it feels like we're in this place where like, oh, it felt like something was going to wrap up. And, and then, but there's, and it seems like we'll be in initiation maybe from here on out <laughs> in some ways. Likely. So, yeah, there's so much going on there. I mean, it's so amazing. Um, I've been studying rites of passage initiation for, I don't even know, 30, oh, 35 years, mm -hmm. something like that. And, and always trying to find uh, ways that it's really deep knowledge and finding ways that it can be used. And so, as you well know, it has these three steps of separation and then ordeal and then the return to community where the initiate returning is seen and recognized to be at a different level of life and the community has to be there too in order to recognize it. And so, um, if you then say, what's going on with us? Well, we are literally in separation. We are social distancing. The, the soul, the psyche, isn't going, oh, I wonder what they're doing. The, the, the soul is saying, they're doing rites of passage. They're all separating from each other. Mm. Um, and so it's literally being acted out. And then that second stage is the ordeal, which in, includes all the issues going on with, with the pandemic, but all the issues going on with politics and all of the institutions that are rattling. I mean all the economic institutions, all the educational institutions, the institution of parenting, everything down the line is rattling. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to us, and the soul is going, we know what this is. Mm -hmm. This is the ordeal or the liminal stage betwixt and between. And now I think what's happening is we're finding out that based on the most recent uh, studies, that it's likely that a coronavirus is going to be with us right through the fall and into the winter. They just don't know. Not knowing is the liminal in between state of betwixt and between and not knowing is the essential place to be in order to get knowledge. Mm. We can only get knowledge where we accept that we don't know. So there's this whole, just like the gift in the wound, not knowing is a blessing if we're open to knowledge coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally to get what you asked about, when you get through, there's supposed to be the community waiting that knew you were gone and wants you to come back as a more healed and a more full person and then can do the blessing and the, and the return that is also called the, uh, the aggregation, putting it back together again, or in, in alchemy it's called the coagulatio, where it comes back together at a new level. And the problem there is two, twofold, really. We have had a problem of where is the community for a long time. So people go through the steps of initiation. It happens uh, a, a woman has a miscarriage and there's separation from the fetus, from the birth she thought was coming, from the family's expectation. And, and she's, she's carrying it in her body and in, in a way of knowing. And that creates the ordeal, the tremendous sense of loss. The, the, and the sense of loss brings up whatever the inner complex is and the wounds are, and that's being suffered. And at the end of that, um, there's supposed to be a community there that says we understand and we know about life and death and we know that it's moved through your body and we know that you've done this in a courageous way that you did and we know that you're suffering but we also know that you're beautiful and now we're going to bless you and we're going to give you gifts and we're going to hold you and we're going to sing so that there's a, co a conclusion to the miscarriage and what happens in modern culture is the miscarriage just continues the miscarriage of the individual person, the miscarriage of justice, the miscarriage of racism, it all just continues. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important question. How does it come to an end, whether it's COVID or racism or whatever? And, and I don't think there's a simple answer. I, I really imagine 
what we're now doing is we're being called to find new levels of humanity, the deeper levels of humanity, uh, which returns us to the sense that the other person is our home. You go back into ancient languages and they will have these ways of saying, you are the other me, uh, my home is in you, this kind of deep sense of humanity. Um, I, and then from there, you can make a new culture perhaps, or renew a culture. The other idea that we've learned through Mosaic and working with oppressed communities and people in trauma is I call it sudden community. And eventually we have to figure out, okay, I went through this heavy duty uh, initiatory experience and I know I'm pretty much through it and I need some, I need to be received by people and I need a blessing and I may have to figure out how to get a group of people together and do it. Um, and we've worked on that in the streets and it's not that hard to do, uh, but it's a little bit surprising to people. So the only form I know right now is sudden community. And one place I see it is in the protests mm -hmm. against racism and against police brutality. And you see a whole group of people that are um, diverse in terms of uh, race and, and ethnicity and so on. And they all kneel down at once mm -hmm. and they're kneeling on the earth and they're as if praying together. And you know, from being in those situations, you can feel we're all together. And then you get that moment of blessing. So I call that a form of sudden community. The only thing that's missing is they may not know it. Mm -hmm. so, so in the midst of protests, those moments of unity are actually blessing moments that can heal the cultural issue, but even the personal issue. Mm -hmm. I have been thinking lately, and I know I'm not the only one, about this proverb you've shared. And I'll let you tell the second half of it, which is what I'm thinking about. It takes a village to raise a child, because aren't we in the midst of this? Will you complete that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. So this is an old African proverb that exists in a number of different tribes, and I think Hillary Clinton used it in her campaign. Um, but there is a second part. Uh, it takes a village to raise a child, but if the young people are not uh, genuinely welcomed into the community, they will burn the building down just to feel the warmth. Mm -hmm. And we know what that means. And, and we've all seen recently the buildings burning. And there's a way in which that seems, you know, destructive. But there's another way in which it's, try, it's instinctively trying to point something out. Mm -hmm. If you have a bunch of businesses and we're not invited into it, if you have an economy where the disparity is so big that some people have to remain poor and some children don't get fed so other people can have more food than they could ever eat, if you do those things, then something inside young people feels so unwelcome that they just might burn the culture down. Mm -hmm. and, and then you add that part just to feel the warmth because the cult, modern culture is not welcoming to young people. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's very effective at selling them um, personal devices <laughs> for the purposes of distraction and sometimes being connected. It is not good at welcoming who they really are and helping them find their own genius mm -hmm. and helping them find ways to healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael, I'd love to ask about the role of ritual in this. And I was thinking so much, you know, in these protests of, you know, being in the men's gatherings and having some pretty tight spots around race and conflict and all of that. And at a certain point, it's like we do all that we can do on a certain level, and then we have to give it up to the ancestors and to the other, other forces. And how, how can that play into where we are right now? Another good question. So Mosaic, our, our nonprofit, for 35 years at least, we have been doing ritual retreats uh, that begin with the personal and the cultural issues and try go into an honest struggle about them. And some of those uh, have been, uh, and hopefully will continue to be just for men, but diverse men, because there's issues that have to be dealt with there. And I think most people realize the amount of male violence in modern world. And so you sometimes have to get the guys separate in order to get down to the nitty gritty of that. But we also do it with women and men, um, because the last 
known um, transformative ritual in the Western world was in ancient Greece where adult women and men went to initiation together. So we have been doing retreats on that basis. The underlying idea is still rite of passage. But in this case, the central part of the passage is the opening of the wounds of culture. And in, in America, in the United States, we know it's about racism. And so, I mean, that is the, people call it the original sin of America, but it's, it's also the original wound. And so, um, so we have uh, worked on this kind of rough ritual where people come in, we don't even know who's in the room. There's as many as 100 or more than 100 people, and each one is bringing a story. And when we come, come together, it's as if the story of the culture enters. And we make it a point of having, uh, you know, gang kids and ex-gang members and ex-convicts and, and professors and, and healers and all kinds of people in the same room. And then we just find our way to really honest talk where sometimes that honesty is someone revealing um, sexual abuse, uh, you know, rape or, or even incest. And there's something about putting that wound out in a community of people that are really listening that really changes that wound and how a person carries it. So that happens. But then eventually we get to um, the mistreatment of women or uh, racism or any of those kind of uh, issues of bigotry come into the room. And, the, and at that point, we always have to remind people, no physical violence. You can say whatever you want, but America's uh, solution for many things has been violent. We can't go there. And the other thing we ask people is don't leave the room. Stay in the ritual, even if it's scary. You can always ask for people to slow down or, or announce your your fears, but we just trust that the soul can handle it. And typically at some point, it's hard to explain it. Usually a person breaks down so far there in such agony that it cracks everything open. And then we try to get everybody in through that opening so that everybody's feeling their own woundedness. And we are human because we're wounded. We're human because we carry genius and we're human because we're wounded. And then we stay in those wounds and then, and this is all really radical because people ask, well, what are the steps and what's the formula? There is none. We make the ritual out of what happened. And so from what happens, we then say, okay, this is the kind of thing where really I think we all need forgiveness. And so we start developing forgiveness rituals and we do it in remote places in forests and um, in the redwood forest that we use down in, in California it is so potent with ancestral trees that we go out and we ask the trees for forgiveness and we create rituals out there where people are moving in the forest and other people are singing and, and may, at times everybody's singing and we're kind of asking for forgiveness from nature and from the trees and it's really potent and amazing and, uh, and we get a little bit healed and we learn a little bit about forgiving ourselves, and that allows us or gives us a capacity to forgive other people. And if it happens with a diverse bunch of people, it really is touching and helping cultural wounds as well as personal wounds. And the trick is, or one issue that I'm dealing with and a bunch of us are working on, is is there any way to bring that, that kind of community healing into a bigger situation. And, and I'm not clear on that. I do know in the middle of a protest, when people are feeling that sense of being together, you could step very readily from protest to ritual healing. It wouldn't take that much. Uh, and I think, even though I think the protests are really meaningful and the political issues are profoundly meaningful, it has to go past that. I really think the only way you heal racism and bigotry and, uh, you know, misogyny is by getting to the bottom of humanity and saying everyone who is born is human. And if anybody is excluded, then humanity is diminished. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the struggle now. But how do you get there collectively? I don't know. And that's okay. I think not knowing is being in the middle of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we knew, 
we'd all get out of it as quickly as we could. Mm -hmm. But not knowing the fact that we don't know what to do with the climate crisis, really, the fact that we can't figure it out and still don't know what to do with coronavirus, wear a mask, socially distance, the rest of it we don't know. They literally don't know. And the fact that it's really hard to know how you stop uh, the police violence, but below that we know is the dehumanization of people. And so not knowing is okay when the issues are so big. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is being open enough to a message that is trying to enter. Mm -hmm. I love that, being open to the message that's trying to enter, you know? Hey, uh, I get that from stories. I, the ancient, I, ancient stories yes. where the first people don't know what to do. And, they, and, and the ones who are most driven by the need to know stand out and face the darkness and messages come in from whoever you want to call it, the muses, the deities, the ancestors, the spirits, mm -hmm. and the knowledge comes from the darkness. Mm -hmm. We've been, as we said, attending your wonderful Friday night classes and highly recommend in advance the upcoming one. And also um, our devoted listeners of your podcast. And I know you're, you know, you have such a wealth, you carry such a wealth of stories. Um, is there one you want to tell right now or, you know, in what you're talking about, about being in the darkness and receiving a message or does anything come? Yeah. Here's a, well, cause I think we just had a podcast go out yesterday for several days. Uh, you know, so being a storyteller is interesting. You just have to learn to be guided, you know, I mean, the way I learn it turns out to be an old thing. I didn't know that at first, but so, um, I watch dreams for what's coming into the dreams and, and even some surprising thing that happens, you know, when I'm watching the deer go by or whatever it is. And something kept tugging at my memory about these notes that I took about um, uh, rites of passage and particularly about communitas. The, the communitas is the old word for deep community. Something so deep happens, it pulls everybody together. And, um, and something was bugging me, so I went back and went through my notes on this stuff, which go back 30 years. And I found um, this description from uh, Victor Turner, who was like the father of uh, American anthropology, uh, about the Ndembu people. So they used to be referred to the, as being in Zaire, but that's now Republic of the Congo. And... Um, so this is about their ritual for when you're going to raise someone to be a chief of the tribe. And, um, and so I went back, and it's very complicated ritual. It's really stunning. It's so imaginative. But the key part about this, about the darkness is, if someone um, is going to be elevated to a position of power and authority, uh, one of the early steps in the process is they have to appear in public. And in some of the rituals, they have to be wearing ashes. And then anyone in the public can come up and accuse them of any of the things that a person might do to misuse or abuse power. And so they're accused of being self-important, self-indulgent. They're accused of being having a tendency towards anger, brutality, and meanness. They're accused of lacking empathy and sympathy. They're accused of theft and, and, and manipulation of things. Does this sound like anybody? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reading this. I haven't read it in like 20 years. And I'm reading it, and I'm going, it's like a description, a description of Donald Trump. Because uh, I've been saying for years, we, we elected the symptoms so that we could see them clearer. So anyway, this is literally the list of things that people accuse them of. And the, and the ritual is that the person being raised into the position of power can't respond. So people say, you're a thief, and, and, and so on, and they can't respond. And so this is a humbling ritual, to humble the person who's about to be elevated to power. And they explain it. And they say, whenever you give people power, then it will be an intensification of um, the temptation to use power for your own good, not for the benefit of the people. And these are the qualities that you will see in someone misusing power. 
In other words, they're psychologically adept, and they're doing a pre-elevation <laughs> kind of uh, uh, process to get this person to become more humble and realize what the danger is. Mm -hmm. um, and the person has to stand as if in the darkness, unable to say, no, uh, no, no, you can't, you can't deny it. You, and you, you're humbled by it. And, and then it turns out this amazing thing, because they then say, the reason why this is so important is anyone who's in power, who violates, who violates what they call the web of things, by using for themselves what should be given to others, is breaking the bonds of humanity. Mm. This is a, like a ritual. Like, how smart are they? And so they say, this is so important, this process, that they do these rituals go on for days. Mm. And, and, and they invite into the ritual the ancestors. And in a sense, what they're saying is, the misuse of power and authority is so damaging to the web of life that we have to include the living and the dead. Mm. And, and if you say that to the average person, they go, whoa, what are you talking about? But what are people doing right now when they're trying to imagine a better, a better community in America? They're referring to Martin Luther King, sometimes Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, Harriet Tubman, they're referring to the ancestors mm -hmm. and trying to bring them into the protests and bringing them into the discussion. So this is an old idea that prefigures all that. And, and the reason I think it's pulling at my psyche so much is we are being literally killed by leadership in this country. Mm -hmm. Literally. I mean, it's, it's an astounding thing to watch and to be part of, to watch, you know, Donald Trump bring the other day young people into a space with no distancing and, and no masks and breathing air that's going through the system inside the building. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, it's like a sacrifice. It's like an unconscious sacrifice for wow. the benefit of the few who are using the power for them own cell, their own selves that is intended to be used for everybody. Mm -hmm. It is a, a damaging of the bonds of humanity and it is a breaking of the web of things. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. And then it feels like there's both, you know, the individual work and then how, when we're embedded in a system that is formed around people with power, damaging the web of things, how, yeah. how to work with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the web of things includes nature, which is where the crises were a few months ago. That was, the main crises. I, I will say something about how I've been seeing it is you start out with the uh, climate crisis, which includes the entire world, culture and nature and all the people and animals in it. Mm -hmm. And then you go to COVID, which narrows it down, interesting animal transmission to human, but it narrows it down and then it gets to the group, but also the individual. Mm -hmm. And then it drops again to George Floyd with a symbolic and literal death of one person in everybody's eyes on video and with the white office representing the whole kind of sin of whiteness or the fallacy of whiteness, literally taking the breath from the black man, which everybody gets in the gut level and symbolically. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then it has to be solved from there up. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another way to look at it. If you get humans are in the web of things or the web of life and at, down at the bottom, if we can do something that shifts the, you know, historical damage uh, of racism and all that's included in there, because there's disparity in there and there's, there's misogyny in there and everything, then what happens is it opens downward from the human soul, it returns to nature. I mean, that's another old idea that at the bottom of the soul is the natural world. Mm -hmm. And so if the misuse of human power and authority breaks the web and then, and then the connection to the web of things is found again, it might go right back into nature. Uh, that's one possibility because we weren't going to do very well with the climate crisis anyway. <laughs> it was failing. So uh, the depth of humanity is connected to the depth of nature and the web of things. I mean, what we're in, I think, is really big. 
and potentially uh, healing that could go, go in many, many directions. And then there are peoples whose genius is how to put this into play. You know what I mean? I mean, there's some of us that might find some of the words or some of the story, and there's others that understand systemic stuff and begin to figure it out. I mean, I think the solution has to be many, many people using their genius. I have no idea how to scale things. It is just out of my ken. It's out of my reach. But someone else knows. And I think that's, we have to count on that. Mm. The, the helping hands of people we don't even know. Mm. It's beautiful. Um, I have two things I want to share. And one is a story I'm sure I heard from you that I was thinking about in the last hellish election cycle <laughs> four years ago. I'm, I'm sure you shared this about in an, some African culture where the ritual was for the person who was going to be elected, you know, somebody had to nominate them. And then they had to go around saying, here's all the reasons I should not be elected. <laughs> and then out of all of that, the people chose whomever. And I thought, wouldn't that be refreshing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there yeah. was some humility and honesty and yeah. instead of that bravado and just ridiculousness. Yeah, I mean, the opposite of the um, kind of consumer society, which mm -hmm. is utterly interrupted which is freaking people out. And it's not just the economy. There are real problems there. People not having work and not having income. But mm -hmm. those were there before too, even when everybody was, when the employment was solely low, supposedly low, we had a big problem there too. Mm -hmm. but here also the idea is that um, the reverse of the electoral system. Mm -hmm. uh, now, where it's confusing, I think, is people want real leaders and they assume that's going to happen in politics. We might, be past, we might be past that point. I mean, we know certain leaders need to go away forever. But, and we can get better ones almost with a dartboard. But, uh, but, but I, don't think, I don't think we actually, what we need in the most meaningful way is political leaders. We need them. You have to take care of business, so to speak, or process. But we need leaders that are acting from an inspired sense of humanity and from the depth of the soul. Mm -hmm. And so in traditional cultures, that would be the elders, not the chiefs. I mean, we need the... So um, huh, this goes back to the rite of passage because you can divide the rite of passage in a sense into three things. Uh, this is more Eliade as a teacher. Uh, and the first one is the... Um, rites of passage that begin with youthful rites of passage, where it's an age stage kind of rite. Um, and so there's a certain model there that most people know it as young people being initiated, but the same model is used for elders, l like you were talking about. You, you would have rites of passage for elders that always involve humbling. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the rites of passage that develops uh, meaningful social groups. And so that could be like a rite of passage for those who are going to be healers, those mm -hmm. who are going to be psychological healers. Though, you know, because we have the, uh, you go to medical school, um, the only thing is you don't learn about medicine. You might learn, you know, surgery and drugs. <laughs> I mean, I'm being big brush here, I don't, but to save time. Uh, so I have, a, I have a son that went to law school. Um, because he was interested in justice, pure and simple. He was interested in justice. And he calls me, you know, maybe it's six months in or five months in, and he says, you know, I go to class every day, and no one, not the teachers, and no one in my class ever uses the word justice. Mm -hmm. It's all about law. Well, no justice, no, no real law, no sense of medicine, no real health. And so we're in this, like, reimagine the whole thing. So that's the second kind of uh, uh, rituals that generate social groups that have meaning. And then the third kind um, is the kind of ritual that generates the individual healers, the uh, truly imaginative teachers, 
uh, what what they used to call and people are talking about again the shamans um, and those who are like the most gifted uh, interperson intercommunity connectors all these people that are essential but don't fit into the other groups um, in a way they're like outsiders um, but only it, it, there's a way in which in terms of big things big kinds of healing at all it comes in through outsiders it doesn't come up through insiders. Mm -hmm. And so there's these rituals of maybe we could call them outsiders anyway, that are unique kinds of people mm -hmm. that, and, and the shaman is the primary example. Uh, the, the shaman traditionally doesn't even live in the village. They live outside the village. And so the only time you see the shaman is if you're in a ritual or your problems are so big, you're going to the shaman. And, and so I know sometimes I'm in California where it seems like everybody's in training to be a shaman. And, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, and, and I'm saying, do you, do you really know what you're after here? Because the shamans are walking the borderland between where the regular community might be and the unseen is. They're like spending a lot of time in that liminal space and, and, um, and it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about people in that level of healing and imaginal change is they know all the pain of everybody. Mm -hmm. It's like a modern therapist participates in that. And everybody comes and brings you your pain. And in the middle of the pandemic, everybody's bringing their core issues. I don't think people are doing the pussy footing around let's talk about psychology for a while they're going right to the core issues mm -hmm. and so that means that the people that are doing that kind of work are absorbing from others the individual and the cultural core issues mm -hmm. and so people that think they want to be there i always say be certain be certain because you will you find yourself on the outside and so out there you have the capacity that more of of the ideas, the images, the energies of the unseen can enter through those people. And then those people have to learn how to handle the fact that they're absorbing the pain of others. And they're also uh, being receptors for uh, inspiration that other people aren't getting. And so anybody doing that, especially in these times where the weight is heavy coming down and the cores are, the core wounds are coming up, anyone doing that needs to have a deep sense of self and some way of healing themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I pulled from one of your, I think it's from one of your recent essays, just this beautiful quote. Uh, if we want the world to change, it has to start inside the human soul. So... I imagine a lot of us want the world to change <laughs> and how do, what, what's the starting place? Like it's an evocative invitation. And like, what does that mean for someone who's listening? Like, that sounds good. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> so yeah, that's not my original idea. That's an old idea. And I was just paraphrasing. Uh, you can say no change at the level of the soul, no change at the level of the world. So it starts with the idea. So this is a antidote to the modern thought that this whole world is like accidental and no one knows what it's about. And each person in it is just a speck in this accidental universe. So how could we possibly do anything? I hear this from people all the time. And it's a misunderstanding. It's not that it, people are the only important beings. It's, it's not that humans are supposed to dominate. We've been trying that for a while. It doesn't work with nature. It doesn't work with culture. It has a different meaning. And, and so the uh, one old idea is the human soul is the make weight in the scales of life. So whether it goes towards a healing direction or more destructive social systems depends on the individual. It's hard to explain that. It, it, but look at what happened with George Floyd. That's one person. Now, uh, people of color have been uh, mistreated uh, treated, been treated unjustly, and, and in fact have been killed in public for a long time. It goes back to lynchings. It goes back to slavery. But here's one man on that one day, which was Memorial Day, 
on that one day where the death of that one person could change this whole culture. The potential is there. It has happened. It's still echoing. So that's what it means. Mm -hmm. If the change in, in a soul happens, maybe it has two meanings. Um, when a change happens at the level of the soul of the individual, that puts ripples into the web of being. And, and it can affect the neighbors. It can affect one's children. Um, it affects one's parents if it comes through a young person. So it's genuine in that sense. And then occasionally in times of crisis, what happens to one person can change everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's not heroics. It's not that idea. It's mm -hmm. not muscling up. It's actually opening deep down. Mm -hmm. And so, so, and then it connects to the idea of genius. Mm -hmm. If, since each person has genius, a potential, to express a meaningful gifts into the world, then when something changes their soul, that changes the conditions in the world. And so if we go back to the idea that there's too many things that need fixing, there is no plan that's gonna, no strategic plan is gonna accomplish that. There is no individual leader that's gonna do it, there's no group of leaders that's gonna do it, but the sense of meaningful leadership, the sense of meaningful uh, living and giving happening to a lot of people could do it. And then you have the change in those individual souls, people waking up, getting a deeper sense of themselves and a deepened sense of the humanity without any organized plan could do it. Yeah. And so I think that's what it means. And whoever people's, whoever the people are that people, uh, that individuals revere, you could call it the heroes, but, it's the people we revere. They change the world in ways that affect us. I mean, I'm affected by all kinds of uh, writers and, and, and poets that are long dead. Mm -hmm. and, and yet they're still affecting me and, and through my soul, a little bit of the world. And so this is something that everybody kind of knows but doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, every time someone mentions someone they revere, I mean, I'm thinking of Mar Martin Luther King because he's, being referred to so much, uh, their soul has been moved by that person. And the fact that their soul was moved actually affects the world. And so um, how many people have repeated the words of and the ideas of the I had a dream speech? You know, that changed the world. It, it hadn't made the change that we want. It didn't get all the way there. But people refer to it and people carry it. And so it has all those meanings. Mm -hmm. No change at the level of the soul no change in the world. We could change the politics. We could do it now. The sooner the better. <laughs> but it doesn't mean it will change the world if it doesn't get to the soul. Mm -hmm. And um, I watch for political people or people aspiring to leadership. I watch if they transform in the process. That's mm -hmm. what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Because that means their soul changed. Mm -hmm. And that means they could be an agent of real change. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing I watch. And that image with the scales is so beautiful. And, and, and just that we don't know what the tipping point could be. You know, what one poem or one act could do to affect that, that balance. Mm -hmm. I'll go about, back to Martin Luther King because um, the part of the speech that most people refer to was spontaneous. He, he wrote some of it before stepping up there and other parts of it just came. And, and so we don't know. And so the, another of the images I have of genius is a person tries to figure out who they really are and what they're called to do and what they might have to give. And then we try to do it. And, and I think we need to learn practices in, in order to do it more effectively or more thoroughly or more creatively. Um, and the idea isn't, oh, now that I'm working on it, someone should come and pay me for it, or someone should come and tell everybody how good it is. It's not that. I think we're just doing it. And then we come to an intersection one day where what we have been working on is needed. And if we're awake and we have the courage of ourself, we offer it. And in that intersection, which is the moment of change and shifting the balance in the weights, one person can change a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And and we just saw it with George Floyd. 
you know, may his soul rest in peace. But his soul may be resting in peace because of the change it's already created. And it's up to the rest of us to be part of that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not just being the collective part of it, like demanding justice, yes. But then the other part of it is how we each express from our own soul and our own genius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good. I, we could talk to you about this for days and days. That's why we come to every class you offer. <laughs> um, so I know we're, we're getting a little bit toward the end, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your upcoming class and kind of what the, the vision of it is and why people should just sign up right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, what, what, what happened is um, I think we're in this moment of potential transformation. And it's not change. Change happens all the time. Transformation means you move from one form to another. And by the way, the only way transformation occurs, you have to shed that which is not working. So, so when people are arguing about defund the police and all, there's policy stuff there, there's cultural stuff there, but at the level of psychodynamics, one reason to defund and even collapse the police department before you make it again is you have to shed the parts that not that not mm -hmm. working. It's like the snake that sheds its skin and miraculously has a new life. They say that was the first image of initiation for humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they saw the snake shed its skin and go away alive, and they saw the dead left behind. So there's something we have to slough off and shed. Um, and in in American culture right now, part of that is the history of racism and people that think they're white beginning to actually understand what happened and begin to shed this pretension of white superiority. Um, so there's a cultural level of that. Um, but I think there's this opportunity for transformation so that after we go through all of this trouble, the upheaval, the, the threat and the actual uh, number of losses and, and coming from the pandemic, um, if we, when we get through it, the only way it makes real sense if we wind up in a different form, a different world. I mean, the argument over actual health care, how anybody could ever return to the previous health system when we see how it has failed during the pandemic, you know, it's so obvious. But what has to be obvious is letting go of the things that don't work. So I think we're in this transformational moment. I call it the liminal moment. Time breaks open. We don't know how long we're going to be in this. I mean, that's really part of it. And so then I, when I was first thinking about and paying attention, it became really clear to me that the underlying dynamic of transformation is rite of passage. It gives a shape and a form. And so even though it's something that has fallen out of awareness, if you go back far enough in history, you can go any place in the world and you would find people doing rites of passage. It was all over the world at one time. And I remember when I first started studying it, it was in the 60s, and uh, pretty much it was disappearing all around the world at the same time. The, uh, you could study the Maasai, which I did, because they were still doing it. And there were other tribes doing it, and there have been other people doing it, but as a collective thing, it disappeared. Now, that happens with archetypes. Like uh, someone once uh, described an archetype as a dry uh, stream bed. And sometimes the water's rushing through it and everybody's getting the energy of the archetype and sometimes it dries up and the water goes somewhere else. So the water went somewhere else, away from rites of passage. But I think now that we're back in it, there's a possibility of reimagining it and using it. And it goes back to one of the questions you asked early on, which was, um, how do we know that it concludes? How do we know when it comes to its end? That's going to be part of what happens now, no matter what. I mean, there's going to be hopefully an end of the COVID-19, but anybody paying attention notices how they're saying there are more pandemics coming down the line because of the collapse between nature and culture that has put certain kinds of animals in proximity of crowds of people in conditions that are not healthy. It's, it's coming. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to wind up in this new world, the essence of which everybody has already heard, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Trump, 
Donald Trump is using the fact that the coronavirus came from China as a weapon. But the message of it is we're all in it together. Every People get sick over there, they're going to get sick everybody. That's where we are. That's the world we're in. It's a world trying to change. And so I took the idea of transformation and I realized one of the few ways to talk about it that gives a, a loose structure, that gives a sense of territory and footing, that gives a sense of individual and community is rite of passage. I can't think of anything else that actually could give uh, so much information about how to deal with change individually and collectively. And then it turns out that there's a lot of material in there. I mean, I intend to talk about some of my favorite things like underworld initiation, which you could put all of the COVID stuff as an underworld initiation. Uh, you have, uh, anytime there's a loss of life or a loss of a loved one, a person is in an underworld initiation. Then you have unfinished initiations, things that started in youth that never got finished and, and what to do with those. And then, and then these other things about initiatory aspects of healers and people that, that gonna affect change. If we don't have the ideas of what it's about, we become less effective in trying to make the changes that we're interested in. I mean, if I go back to that Ndembu uh, ritual of investiture, the savvy that they have to call people before they're brought up or to question people, you know, how, how do we avoid electing another would-be dictator? You have to question their motives. You have to examine them. Have you ever done things for other people? Well, if you've never done it before, guess what? When you're given power, you're not going to learn how to do it. You're probably going to fall into the temptation to get more for yourself. And so the, the, the levels of learning, I think, include reimagining education. So here's an interesting thing. In, in Western culture, in the United States, we call it high school, right? And there's four stages. The freshman, the sophomore, the junior, and the senior. Those are the stages of initiates. <laughs> it comes straight out of rites of passage. The freshman is the young initiate, has no idea where they are or what to do, and has to follow others. The sophomore comes from the Greek, sophe moronis, the wise fool. The sophomore thinks they know everything, but they don't. <laughs> and, uh, and then they eventually have to uh, learn things from the juniors, who are the ones who have actually learned the ropes in the three years that they are juniors, and, uh, and then that's why they support the seniors who are the ones who are about to graduate from the rites of passage to the next rites of passage because that, that's what turns out to happen. Once you qualify and complete one, you're ready for a bigger, deeper one. But anyway, our education is based on that setup without anybody knowing that's what's going on. And so you get classes without understanding the classes. Uh, and so... I think we're in this transformational moment that it could include transforming education as well as health and health care, as well as uh, the human sense of mutual humanity, as well as politics. You know, I think that's the opportunity, and that's, I think, why it's possible to say that everyone's genius is being called upon. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. May they come forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is not the time to hold back. Yeah. <laughs> so much is needed and so much is possible. Um, you know, and I know you knew this, know this because we've talked about it, but the other myth that's in play is apocalypse, mm -hmm. which apocalypse has come to mean the big fiery end. And it looks like we're in the apocalypse. I mean, in many, many ways. But apocalypsis, which was the old Greek word, means collapse renewal. That's where we are. We're in the collapse of, of the institutions and then nearby, just as the, the gifts are near the wounds, the renewal is near the collapse. Mm -hmm. And the model is always nature. And that's what all the ancient people knew. Mm -hmm. The big trees in the forest fall down and they rot back into the earth and from there comes the new trees. Mm -hmm. It's just that now it's happening fast. Mm -hmm. I remember protesting and being part, trying to be part of cultural change in the 60s 
it took a long time for the protest to catch on. This is moving so much faster. This is literally more transformative if we can figure out how to make healing and make beauty and meaning out of the transformation. Mm. It's, 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 it's happening whether we like it or not. The question is how can we get in it in a meaningful way and help each other? Mm. Deep thanks for all the ways you make beauty and meaning. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just try to do my job, you know. I figured mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be like a storyteller in the old sense, where you tell the story, you try to make sense of it, too. So, mm -hmm. We're so great. It's always great to talk with you. Yeah, wonderful to talk with you, too. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, be well. You, too. Safety and protection for the family. You, too. And uh, we'll see you in class. <laughs> All right, see you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Uh, if you enjoy this podcast, it's great if you want to share it with friends or post about it on social media. Also, you could make a donation to support the podcast or find out more information about our classes and offerings at our website, embodimentmatters.com. Mm -hmm.